and welcome everyone. I hope you're all nice and healthy and staying home. Um, so today, as I just mentioned, it's the, the final installment of our Grow Your Own series for getting your garden up and going for the year. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about lighting your seedlings. We're also going to talk about thinning them and then I'm briefly going to go over the hardening off process because it's a complicated one and we want to leave you um, as successful as possible. Um, so to begin, let's go with a brief recap of what we've talked over the past few days. Um, so um, from that point in which you've planted those seeds, that germination to that emergence period is a very, very delicate time. And so, you know, as we spoke about in our last session, it's really important to keep your seeds evenly watered until they have emerged from the soil. Um, and that goes for being outside as well. And I just wanted to offer a little tip for keeping your seeds outside nice and watered. Um, if you are growing cold hardy varieties right now, then whenever it snows, which is very sporadic out here, go out, you know, when you're shoveling your sidewalk and just scoop that snow onto your garden beds. And that is all gonna melt down and, you know, it's a really cheap way for you to actually end up watering your garden in the springtime. Um, you know, when it comes to indoor seeds and they're going through that germination to that emergence period, try to not move your seed trays around that much because they're really, really delicate in there and that goes for watering them, you know. So when you're watering them, try to not disturb the seeds too much. But then also if you're picking up your trays and moving them all the time, that's gonna lessen your chance of having good germination rates. And so keep them nice and stationary. So the seeds have emerged, right? You've got your first little baby seedling popping up and that's what we call the emergence. And those first two leaves that you're gonna see on a seedling are called cotyledons. Is everyone here familiar with, the, hi Jesse. Is everyone here familiar with cotyledons? Did you learn that in science school back in the day? <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple yeses and a couple noes. Um, so let's show you an example of a cotyledon here. Here's a good one. So I just planted these lettuces the other day and all those little baby leaves, those are the cotyledons. So they don't look like the actual vegetative leaves that that plant's gonna grow. Their main goal as a part of the plant is to just photosize, uh, photosynthesize as much as possible as fast as possible. And so this is another really delicate time in the plant's life. And um, so it's really important to continue to water really evenly when you see those cotyledons. And then once those true leaves start to, see, to show up, We'll talk about a little bit later that thinning process that you're going to go through. Um, oh, and then making sure that your seedlings are underneath light as soon as they have emerged and as soon as you're seeing those cotyledons is really, really important. If you're keeping your seedlings underneath a grow light before they have emerged, then it's likely that your germination period is actually going to increase. So these were um, a variety of lettuce that on the seed packet it said, five to seven days until germination and emergence. Okay, it actually only took three days. And so I would start saying checking your seeds at the three day mark if they're underneath um, a light source or if they're in a hot spot or underneath a, or on top of a heat mat is really, really important. So start checking them right away. So as soon as they do emerge, you can get them underneath the light source. Um, so speaking of lighting, let's go over the steps for it. And um, I just wanna warn you that lighting can be a really expensive thing, but that we're gonna try to offer some tips and tricks today to make it really affordable for homeowners. Um, in the hierarchy of lighting, there is this, you know, like expensive thing going on. There's also this viability thing going on. And so the most viable, but also the most expensive options obviously would be to do either a greenhouse for your seedlings or to do a full spectrum LED. Now, you may be like, what the heck is a full spectrum LED? We're gonna talk about the differences in lighting options today, but um, full spectrum, that's basically gonna be that purple light that you're gonna see people growing things with. Uh, it uses a lot of energy, which is a downside if you are a homeowner, because your electrical bill may go up. Um, but the thing is, the more energy you have, the easier it is to transfer those seeds outdoors eventually, right? Because it's mimicking the sun really, really well. Um, so the more powerful your light, the easier it is to harden them off later in the process. Uh, and then here in Colorado, hardening off plants can actually be a really tricky process. Um, and so a full spectrum LED is a good option and it'll last you a lot of years. Uh, the, the middle road of this expensive and viable, you know, hierarchy 
would be the um, fluorescent bulb, which is actually what I do at my house. Um, fluorescent bulbs, they take a little bit less energy from your home. They're usually going to be a white light, and um, they typically go by the name of a T5. And so what I have at my house are two two-bulb T5 lights, and that's what we hang over our seedlings. Um, you know, I've got my seeds actually growing in an eastern facing room, and so I have them in a reflective tent that will maximize the amount of light that they can get. Um, you know, and if you're hearing me say all these things you may need, I just want to assure you that here in Boulder, Craigslist is actually a really good option for getting this grow equipment because of the hemp industry in town. And there are a lot of reused lights um, that go up for sale on Craigslist. And so if you're wanting to get, you know, a good, a good bargain on your light, check out the farm and garden section on Craigslist. Um, so as I mentioned in my home, I use two T5s and then I use a grow tent. And that whole set setup cost, uh, cost me about $150. So each of those lights runs about $60. The full spectrum LEDs you're going to be seeing over, or the T5s cost me $30 a light. Full spectrum are going to be over $60 a light. And so it's going to, you know, it's going to be a, a little investment you make up front. Um, one thing about both of those artificial lighting situations is that you really want to hang them as close to the seedlings as possible. So if you have bungee cord type things in your home or zip ties, um, we have some adjustable straps. I've also people, seen people use belts. Um, that's gonna let you hang that light and then raise it as your seedlings grow taller so that they're still very close um, to the seedlings. Uh, one thing to mention is that the, the heat of the light can dry out your seedlings a lot faster if you're growing indoors. And so um, if you remember the last session, I talked about these little plastic domes that you can put over the seedlings. In my house, I put the plastic domes over the seedlings and then hang the T5s above those domes. So they're actually a little bit higher off of the seeds than maybe you would want. But the good thing is I'm having to check on my seedlings less and water them less. So for me, it feels like a worth it type of thing. Uh, all right, so at the bottom of the lighting hierarchy, that's where we're gonna encounter the south facing window. And in the south facing window, there's a hierarchy of itself, right? And so if you've got a beautiful bay window in your house, where those seedlings are gonna get light from the top and the side and it's gonna be south facing, then you know, that, that may be a viable option for you to grow your seedlings there. The other south facing window I've seen work would be um, an unobstructed dormer window where they're just getting pure south facing light. Um, that tends to be okay. You know, if you're like me, you know, in my home, I've got some south facing windows, but I have some trees in front of them. So even though it's south facing, it's still dappled light. I ran an experiment and I tried to grow some, um, I believe these are spinach seedlings in the south facing window. And this is the result I got. So super leggy, super wobbly. I can throw them around. They're a really light green color for spinach. And I'm really, really not liking the result that I'm seeing here. They're leggy. And so if your seedlings are getting, you know, super thin, super tall, super spindly, or they're not really the dark green color that you're looking for, that's a sign that they're not getting adequate lighting. Um, and so a few ways to cheat that would be to rotate your plants every day. So a different portion of them is getting that south facing light and they're not just reaching towards that light all day. Um, or, you know, I would go ahead if you had a south facing window and it wasn't a bay window or a dormer, go ahead and purchase one T5 light and hang that on, the t on top of them. And that combination of that south facing light coming in the window and that fluorescent light going down on them is usually gonna create a good enough climate that you'll like your result of your seedlings. One thing that you can grow in a south facing window very successfully, even if it's dappled light, is microgreens. And so I just trimmed these actually because they were my breakfast. Um, but I go ahead and grow microgreens, which are um, you know, essentially baby greens. They're super nutrient dense. And since they're not trying to get all the way through that life cycle of a plant, uh, you can tend to, or you tend to be able to grow them in a south facing window a lot better than you would um, say a tomato plant. All right, so that's the lighting. We're happy to offer consultations on it if you have any questions, but let's move on to thinning your seeds. Uh, I will warn that some people get really emotional about this process because you are pulling baby seeds. Uh, or baby seedlings, but I want to assure you 
that if you're growing greens or something, that they make a delicious snack. And so they're not going to waste, right? And you can always put them in your compost pile. So the process of thinning your seeds is um, pulling the extra seeds from your cells, or if you're outdoors, it's the process of pulling the extra seedlings um, so that you achieve the proper plant spacing that you're wanting for that specific variety. So indoors, you would thin your seedlings if you had more than one plant per cell. Um, in the process of thinning, uh, once those true leaves are those vegetative leaves, so the third or the fourth leaf shows up on those seedlings, then it's time to thin. And all you do is you really gently pull it straight up out so that you don't disturb the root of the other seedling. And you always pull the weaker seedling out of the situation. And so the weaker seedling may be the smaller one, it uh, may be slightly discolored, um, or it may be the one that's less centered in the cell, right? So if you're remembering what I said, you want as much soil as possible around those seedlings. And so getting them in the center of the cell is really, really important. So in seedling, pull the ones that are over to the side of the cell. Uh, if you are outdoors, read your seed packets for the proper spacing that you should be thinning to, right? And so something I would commonly see people overplant would be uh, carrots, okay? So the carrot seeds are really, really small. You direct plant them because they're a root vegetable. Uh, you don't want to plant them and then transplant them because that will disturb the root, the carrot. Um, and so in that process, you want to thin them, I think it's to every two inches for carrots. And you really don't want to shortcut that. Like you want it to every two inches or more so that you have proper carrot development. Uh, you know, the only thing that you should really shortcut your spacing with is greens. If you're wanting to grow baby greens for like a really tender and delicious um, salad, and you know, you're growing a mixture of baby kale and baby lettuce and um, maybe some baby chard in there, then you can go ahead and just ignore the plant spacing on those and plant them pretty thick um, and in a, you know, a patch if you wanted to. You know, but if you're wanting to achieve a head lettuce or a nice rosette of spinach, then you're really going to want to pay attention to that proper plant spacing. Uh, it really breaks my heart when people try to shortcut, you know, tomato spacing by two inches or something. And then those plants are too crowded and they create too much of a humid microclimate and those tomatoes, they're really fungal disease susceptible. And so you're actually gonna, you know, most likely lose your tomato crop later in the year in August after all of that time of you waiting and tending to those plants. And so really pay attention to that, that, um, that plant spacing that the packet says. And again, eat the baby greens as you thin. Don't just throw them away, they're delicious. All right, so we've gone over lighting, we've gone over thinning, now let's go over the hardening off process. And as I'm talking about this, I just want you to keep it in your head that the hardening off process is not a burden, it's an opportunity to have really, really healthy plants that are really, really familiar with their new place where they're gonna be transplanted, right? So if you're adopting a pet from the animal shelter and you bring it home, you don't wanna rush that process and overwhelm the pet immediately, right? You wanna get that pet acclimated to its new home. The same goes for these baby plants. You really want them to be acclimated to the spot in which they're gonna be growing outdoors. So once your seedlings are ready to be planted outdoors, um, which for you know warm season crops, again, late May or June 1st, and then cold hardy crops can be planted right now, um, you'll need to harden them off if you have started them from seeds indoors. And this process, it takes about a week to 10 days. So you're gonna kind of backtrack and do the math. When you wanna plant them, count 10 days back and start the hardening process. Hardening off is the process of transferring indoor plants from their controlled, safe little microclimate to the wild and sometimes chaotic outdoors, right? And so these plants, they need to get acclimated to the wind and to the sun and to the potential rain and hail that they're gonna be facing. Um, and so the way that you acclimate them to this is you just start sending them outdoors, right? And so put up a card table next to like a tree or something, and then set them outdoors for an hour or two in the shade. So I like to put them next to a, tra a tree in some like dappled light, you know? Um, and then once they've been out for an hour or two, bring them back in. And then the next day when you go to put them back outside again, increase that by an hour or two every day until you've reached nighttime. Now as you're hardening off your seedlings, 
you know, it's important to move them not only in the amount of time that they're spending outdoors, but also in the amount of sunlight and the, the sheer power of the elements that they're going to be exposed to. And so um, increasing them by an hour or two every day and then increasing them a little bit by the amount of sun that they're going to see. Now, when you reach evening, you know, you've set it out long enough, you're at the evening time, leave those plants out for a couple hours at night and then bring them back in. And here in Colorado, we've got these crazy temperature swings from day to night. So this is a really important part of it because that nighttime is pretty dang cold still, right? And so we want them to be familiar with that before they're stuck in the ground and, you know, out there to fend for themselves. Uh, so like I said, this process takes anywhere from a week to 10 days, but you can really slow it down if you want to. You know, if you want to only increase it by an hour a day, then just do the math of how long that's going to take you and then backtrack from when you want to plant them outdoors. I will say don't make this take, you know, three weeks or something because your seedlings are going to become root bound. And um, just like a human or an animal, they want to know the environment they're in. So that could be really confusing for them to be hardened off for such a long period. One other thing that is Colorado specific that I want to mention about transplant or about um, hardening up your plants so you can transplant them is that here in Colorado we get these crazy Chinook winds, right, when we're moving from the cool to the warm season. And with that comes the monsoon season. And so it happens to align right with the hardening off season for our warm season vegetables out here. And so Keeping in mind, if you have a really windy location or a location that has encountered a lot of hail in the past years, that you're gonna wanna provide some amount of um, a block from those elements for these seedlings at the start of their hardening off process, and then slowly introduce them to the potential wind that they will face. Uh, that's really one reason out here why you wouldn't wanna plant a leggy plant like this one uh, because as soon as that schnook wind hits it at, you know, 65 miles an hour or something, that ceiling is just going to get knocked down, right? And so we want them to be really strong and really able to uh, withstand those winds or those really heavy um, rainstorms. All right, so we've gone over lighting, we've gone over thinning, and we've gone over hardening off, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions, so I am ready to hear them. Great. Okay. Um, Mick had asked a question about sunlight instead of using artificial light. I feel like you addressed that. Mick, do you, do you have more, do you have more to ask about that? Okay. I think he's set. That's a um, window. So South minute. facing window. Okay. Beautiful. And then uh, an important clarifying question from Alice. She said, uh, when leaving them out in the evening hours, do you also increase one to two hours per night? So does that mean you're having to bring them in at 2 a.m. or something? No, just do just do it for one night. Great question, Alice. Uh, so, you know, once you hit that evening time, bring them in when you go to bed. Uh, so for me, sometimes that's 930 and sometimes that's midnight, but usually it's 930. Um, so I would probably have to get up actually a little bit later and bring them in around 1030 or 11, but give them a couple solid hours of that nighttime weather that they're going to encounter. Okay, great. Only need to do that for one night and then the next day go ahead and transplant them. Oh, okay. Great. Um, and then Kaylee asked if she can uh, use a cold frame to harden off or does that change the process and maybe you can just explain quickly what a cold frame is. That's fabulous. I hope you have one because that is a wonderful thing to have. A cold frame is essentially, um, let's call it a baby greenhouse or a little microclimate. So usually it's a raised bed with something like a glass or plastic top on top of it that's still going to let all the sunlight through but that you can open up and kind of prop it. And so they can still get airflow in there and everything but that glass is going to protect them from the elements and also allow it to really heat up and be a great climate in there. So it's a great way and a rather affordable way to convert your raised beds to baby greenhouses. Hardening off in a cold frame is wonderful. So that's at that top hierarchy with the full spectrum LED in the greenhouse. The cold frame falls underneath that where it's a great method. I guess I'm curious to know if people feel daunted by the whole use of lights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so at our house we have a baker's rack and then we have not the fancy lights, just hanging on chains that we can then lower 
and raise. And I guess, Fern, it'd be interesting, maybe we can follow up with some resources of simple setups that people can do in their house. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if you want to say anything about, or I, maybe I'm projecting. I don't know if anyone else feels daunted by that, but Fern, do you, do you want to say anything? It is a little bit daunting, I must admit. Um, and so I'm with Mara where I have the fluorescent lights, right, that I can raise and lower. And those are those T5s. Um, and so, you know, if you're a little bit spooked, we can absolutely send out a resource. But I just want to assure you that it's really, um, it's not that daunting of a situation once you get going on it. And there are a lot of tools out there to make it a really passive process. And so, you know, I have mine on a timer that was really affordable and I got it at McGuckin's. And so I don't have to go turn the light on or off. And, um, you know, all I have to do is check on them once a day and make sure that they're properly underneath the light, that the light's a good height and that they're watered. Great. And so Nicole commented that um, they're happy with their grow tent that they, they bought for $37 and it's four tiers. Do you want to say something more about that? Grow tents are great. Um, they're going to be a reflective tent that creates a really lovely microclimate. If you're going to be using a grow tent, which we do in our house, um, you want to make sure that you always clean up any of the spilled water on the bottom of it because it's a really good environment for mold to grow. And so that's bad for you, but it's also really bad for the seedlings and will lead to dampening off. So keep it clean, keep it ventilated, and then always keep the zipper a little bit open so that it can let out all of the air and everything that it needs to. Great, and um, I'll, Nicole s included some information about hers that I can send to you guys. Um, so Alice was wondering, with Colorado's short growing season, what do you re when do you recommend we start? When do you recommend we start with seeds versus simply buying seedlings? That's a great question. Um, so if you're going to do the route of seeds, every plant needs a different amount of time in seedling form for it to achieve like its best self, right? Before transplanting it out. So for tomatoes, right, you want them to go for um, roughly eight weeks. Uh, for some lettuces though, you only need to grow them for two weeks before you can transplant them outside. And that just frees up a little bit of space in your garden um, so that you can plant the successions really efficiently, right? So if you're not having to wait for things to germinate in your garden, and instead your garden is something that's always yielding, the, the successions and the starting indoors is just a complementary system to keep those going. Now, if you are looking at your watch right now and you've said, I did not plant any of those six week or eight week long plants that need that time before they can be transplanted outdoors, it's probably time to start considering purchasing um, seedlings for those those varieties. So things like tomatoes and peppers. Um, there are a ton of great places in town that are going to be selling seedlings. I believe we're going to be selling seedlings this year. Yes, we're going to be selling seedlings this year, which is really, really exciting. And they're almost all heirlooms. Um, and so they're delicious. Uh, so, you know, if you haven't started your tomatoes or peppers, go ahead and purchase those from seedlings. But it's still, there's still plenty of time for you to start kale and chard and lettuce and beets right now. Um, any more questions? Does anyone need any clarification on the lights? What exactly to get? Alice, go ahead. Alice? I haven't learned how to raise my hand via Zoom, so I'll just say it physically. <laughs> um, so if we're going to get seedlings for certain things, do you recommend that we get them like shortly before we're going to plant them outside? And do those still need to be hardened off? Or do you recommend we get them and then grow them inside for a certain amount of time? Or does it depend on the plant? Well, that's a really good question. You're full of great questions. I love this. Um, so if you're going to be purchasing seedlings, you want to purchase them as close as possible to the time in which you will be planting those seedlings. So you're not going to see a lot of seedling sales for those warm season crops until mid-May, all right? Um, you really don't want to be carrying those inside after you've purchased them because all seedlings should be hardened off. Now that's a really important thing to ask the person you're buying seedlings from, especially if you don't know your farmer who you're getting them from, right? And so making sure that those seedlings have been hardened off because if they haven't been, odds are they're gonna die pretty instantly for you, which is a real bummer. Um, and then if they are hardened off, that means they're good to go. You can head home and plant them that day. Mm -hmm. But don't, if, I, if it's already hardened off, don't bring it back inside. 
because that almost starts hardening it off in the wrong direction, right? It reintroduces it to a safe microclimate. Um, so Dita asked how to purchase seedlings from Boundless. And so I, I can answer a little bit and then I'll let you chime in as well. But so we're growing, our fern is growing our seedlings at the Cure Organic Farm greenhouse this year. And um, we are still figuring out the exact timing and how many seedlings we'll have to sell versus how many are going into the micro farms that we're building. Um, Fern, do you have anything else to say on the time frame? They will all be hardened off and they will be ready for purchase. However many we have will be ready for purchase um, in late May. And if you are on, if you join our email list, which is you can join on the bottom of every page of our website, you can sign up for our newsletter and you'll know, be notified when, when we schedule that and where it will be. Yeah, and I want to add that the really nice thing about buying seedlings from a local farmer is that they already know the varieties that do really, really well in Colorado specific growing climate. And they may already be saving those seeds from past growing seasons. So the actual lineage of the plant may know very well in its DNA how to grow in Colorado. And so, you know, a portion of the seedlings that we're growing this year were seed saved from our harvest from last year. Um, and the rest of them are just varieties that uh, do really, really well in Colorado. And so it kind of takes some of the pressure off of you. But if you like going out and purchasing your seeds and starting them and everything, I really want to encourage everyone to do that as well because it's a really fun and engaging and frankly, it's a delicious process. So this is the third in our three-part series around, you know, starting seeds at home. Um, so if a number of you have been on all of the calls, do you have any questions that have popped up since our first call that you want to take a moment to have for an answer now before we wrap up? Wow, look at that. <laughs> um, great. And so I will follow up with an email to everybody with um, links to these um, and you can review them. We also, as I mentioned before, uh, we're open to other ideas. So if other people, uh, if, you, if there's something else you'd love us to cover to support you as you're growing your own food, let us know. Fern loves doing these. And it just feels like in this moment with um, coronavirus, we just want to support as many people growing food in their yards as possible. Um, and then Fern is also doing one-on-one uh, -on -one virtual consults for $20 for 30 minutes and you can show her your yard. Alice has done one with us actually. Um, and, and you can, and she can give you advice that's specific to your situation. Um, Alice, did you have a question? Well, I just, I was going to put in a plug for the consultation, which was fabulous and super helpful. And I was just telling a friend today about it because she wants to start a garden um, and is feeling super overwhelmed at the process of like what materials to use for garden boxes and what to plant and she's feeling behind and planting seeds and all that. So Mara, she'll probably be reaching out to you shortly. Um, it was a super streamlined way to get all of my questions answered as opposed to being on the internet and going down rabbit holes with every link that you click on. So that was really great. And then just a suggestion for a future tutorial would be, as we've talked about during the consultation, is how to prune tomato plants. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I got that on my calendar already. Did awesome. in August, I think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I'd say is we'd love to see what you guys are growing. So if I don't know if you're posting on social media, tag us or just send us a photo because it would be fun to see what everyone's growing and how it's going. Well, Mara, we had another question in the chat. Oh, actually. sorry. Um, Nicole wants to know: Will the seed packet say? if you need to um, scarify your seeds um, or soak them. Uh, some will, some won't. Can't guarantee that they will. But just remember for the stratification process, most perennials and wildflowers and also certainly cut flowers need to be stratified in order to increase germination. Now for beet seeds, that scarification process, uh, the only seeds I'm going to guess you're going to be growing that need to be scarified, unless you're growing trees or something, are going to be beets and nasturtium. And that's because they have a really thick testa, which is the outer layer of the shell. Great. And there's, 
in our earlier, I think the first, first video, there's more information about that as well and how to do it mm -hmm. if you need a reminder. Great. Um, Fern, any parting words from you? Uh, like Mara said, if you do grow a garden this year, please send us photos because it makes me really, really happy. So thank you everyone for joining us today.